Hi, John. We'll get started in about five minutes. So thanks for your patience. So, John, if I recall correctly, last week you were asking me questions about the momentum and energy labs. Am I correct? I thought I explained some stuff to you. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, we'll see how, what the turnout looks like tonight because we may be able to keep this fairly short since you've actually done the experiments already. Um, but we'll see. You know, just depends. So, give me about five minutes or so and we'll. We'll kind of, um, you know, take a look and see who's here and then we'll move forward from there. All right. Hi, Landon. Uh, thanks for joining in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And start my video. I do apologize. I, now I got it turned on here for you. All right. 
So I wanted to share um, some items that I've been putting in the announcements for you, just so you know are aware. Of course, I post the links to our um, our class videos uh, in the announcements. Uh, you know, when once I've got them all, all captioned. Um, but let me see. Actually, I have to add those to it. Let me show you what I'm talking about, and I'll be putting those in the course for you. But let me just show you what they look like uh, in another class that where I, I have added them. So in the announcements, you might see links to items that um, for these are like extra videos. So they're not the class videos that we of our sessions but there's some extra videos on the various topics. You know, I've taught these classes multiple times and I've made lots and lots of videos on these topics. And so I thought, you know, it would be useful if I, if, if I shared them, um, you know, with, with the classes and not just have them go away, so to speak, once a semester is over. So uh, I will be adding those items to, to the announcements and, I'll just label them extra videos. And so you'll know that they're not from my class sessions, but just, just an extra tool that you can use as you uh, work through the material. Um, Landon, if you don't mind, uh, I, was, I had a conversation with John earlier and uh, he indicated that he has uh, already, um, well, last week he was here and he was, he was, you know, available for our session. And he and I talked and I explained some things about the lab for him. Uh, and the labs last week actually dealt with the lecture topic we're covering this week. So this is an example of how, you know, our schedule kind of got out of sync. Um, and, and I do believe that might've happened because of, uh, you know, when I had the, the snafu of not, not uh, logging in or something happened. I was having plumbing issues and I didn't maintain the schedule. So uh, I wanted to ask you as well, uh, are you in one of my lab classes, Landon? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and let me just ask, have you already done the experiments that deal with momentum and um, energy? Uh, I believe so. I did uh, all the labs I would do like last week, like last okay. Saturday. Can you tell me what section you're in? Because we can take a look and I'll tell you if, you, you know, and we will know. Not that I'm trying to put you on the spot. I'm just looking at the schedule. So uh, you, you know what section you're in? Um, or L1 or your class has been going on. It didn't just start, right? Oh, no, it just started. Your lab class just started. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so then yeah you're definitely not um, you're not uh, facing that issue so even if you're in ol three or ol four you haven't got to the experiments that deal with uh, energy and momentum you're probably still doing just finished doing maybe graphing or density or something like yes, that. yes ma'am that's what we did graphing and density. Yes right okay so yeah then then this doesn't even pertain to you because actually what's happening for you is that the lecture class is way ahead of what you're covering in lab, but because it's a second eight weeks course is going to very quickly catch up. You, you know, eventually you're going to be caught up in terms of the experiment that you're doing with the topics that we've covered in lecture. So um, you have that to, uh, to look forward to. So, so you're, you're pretty, pretty well set because you're learning the topic in lecture before you ever have to do it in lab. Um, unfortunately, because the schedule got out of sync, John might have had to work ahead in the lab. But you know, I would tell students, hey, that means you've had a, um, an opportunity to do some things hands-on that should make what I cover here in lecture fairly straightforward. Okay, so um, you know, I try to put a positive spin on it either way. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into this uh, information dealing with momentum. So you can see the kinds of things that we'll be focusing on here. So of course we wanna know what is momentum um, and it's 
I like to say it's first cousin impulse. And um, we'll look at, you know, how you use the use the various formulas that relate to momentum and impulse. We'll look at the law of conservation of momentum. And then we'll look, look at how that law of conservation of momentum is important when we um, look at different types of collisions. And so for this particular topic, you have some items on your plate to finish by this Saturday. Uh, that is the problem set eight. Problem set eight actually deals with last week's material on gravitation that I covered here in the lecture class. Um, you have a discussion that goes with this week's material on momentum. And then you have a, a bonus opportunity and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, and of course, you know, you have some resources. Chapter seven in your textbook deals with a momentum. And then I have some videos and a simulator. And we'll actually take a look at that simulator here shortly. Um, John, you have already used this simulator, if I'm not mistaken, if you've done the momentum lab. Yes, ma'am. I think so. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as I said, this will kind of be like a, you know, maybe hearing it this time around in the lecture class will actually make it like you'll be very strong in your understanding of it. All right, so let me talk about this second bonus that you have access to, and then we'll get into the momentum stuff and then we'll go into the energy materials. So the second bonus opportunity um, deals with what I like to call my Newton jet car. So the challenge is to build a car using the materials that I've listed and try to build it in a way that it'll travel as far as possible. And I, I give an estimate, at least three meters, you know, that that's, I mean, if it, if it doesn't go to three meters, at least, hopefully at least, you know, it, it does move <laughs> once, you, once you've built it and tested it. So now the way this bonus works is that it's worth 10 bonus points, but you can add it to the items of your choice, except for the project and the overall core score. So you could say, okay, I wanna go back and add my 10 bonus points to my midterm. No problem, I got you covered. You could say, I wanna hold my 10 bonus points and put it toward the final exam, no problem. Or I wanna take five of my bonus points, put it on the midterm, and I wanna put five of my bonus points on problem set number seven. However you wanna split the 10 points up is your choice. You use it where you feel it's most effective, <laughs> except you can't add it to the project score and you can't add it to the overall core score, okay? So now the materials that are listed here are the only things that you can use. The scissors are for cutting. They're not part of the car, okay? Uh, the plastic lids, that's what, like drink cup lids or I've even had some students, um, you know, use, um, they CDs or just something along those lines, okay? Um, I always tell students, if you're not sure about whether something is legal or not, just email me and ask me, hey, can I use this to build my car? And I'll let you know. Skewers, that's like, uh, you know, what you use to make, make shish kebab on your barbecue grill. Uh, I don't advocate using metal skewers, plastic or wood because of the weight of them, uh, straws, one balloon, and then one tray. A tray could be like a cardboard tray, could be like an aluminum foil tray, it could be like a styrofoam tray, like uh, when you go in the grocery and you buy uh, meat and they have the meat on these like styrofoam looking trays, pink, white, sometimes yellow. Uh, you can use that, just make sure you sanitize it real good before you use it. So you have to use those materials to build your car. And then the other thing you have to do is you have to include a write-up that explains how each of Newton's laws apply to the motion of the car. So the two things you're gonna turn in, um, you have to submit a picture of your car. And let me go ahead and I'm gonna edit that right now because I have students that send me the write-up but they don't send me 
a picture or a video of the car. And I, my question was, or well, how am I going to know if you actually built it if you don't send me something showing showing the car? Okay. Um, so I'll put here. Driving to school. Huh? I'll drive it to school and show you. I'm not at the school. I teach online. I'm. So my all my classes are, are virtual. So you won't find me on campus. All right. So um, you know, so you have to turn in the write up that explains how Newton's laws is relevant for and applies to the motion of the car, and you have to include a video or a picture of the car. Okay. Any questions on that bonus? All right. So now let's jump into the material for tonight. So I'm going to go through the material on momentum here in this packet, and then I will um, look at we'll look at some sample problems dealing with momentum, and then I'll come back to the weekly overviews and I'll look at energy, and then we'll look at some um, examples of where energy is uh, relevant. Okay. So we are focused in this course on linear momentum, meaning momentum for an object that's moving in a straight line. Uh, there is a momentum that deals with an object that's rotating called angular momentum, but we don't focus on that. So we don't have to keep saying linear momentum because in this course, anytime we say momentum, that's what we mean. Okay, and so the way you find this momentum is by multiplying mass times velocity. So we use the symbol P, the lowercase p for momentum. And the way you find momentum is to multiply mass times velocity. The momentum is a vector. And that's because velocity is a vector. And that means that direction matters. I, two objects can have an identical mass and identical speed, but if they're moving in different directions, their momentum is different because direction matters for a vector. Five meters east is not the same as five meters west because the direction is different. Okay, I'm just giving that as an example. That's not momentum, but I'm explaining how uh, having a different direction makes the property different, okay? So keep that in mind at all times when you're dealing with momentum that you're dealing with a vector. And so you have to account for direction. Um, so again, linear momentum, you'll see sometimes in textbooks, but that just means momentum. Now, uh, without going into a whole lot of the math, um, Linear momentum is related to Newton's second law. In fact, if we look at how an object's momentum changes per unit time, so delta P over delta T, that's equal to the net force. Well, if you remember from Newton's second law, net force is also equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, so um, by utilizing the change in momentum over the change in time, we have an alternate way of writing Newton's second law. Okay, um, that's why when we learned F equals MA, I told you that that you know that's just a simple way of looking at a at uh, an object's uh, net force, right? But you can look at it from the perspective of change in momentum over change in time as well. Okay, so. Um, you know, since we are dealing with this new property momentum, we have to always remember that that is something that can be measured. So we have to look at the, the units in the metric system, right? So momentum is mass times velocity. So we have kilograms for mass times meters per second for velocity, kilogram meters per second. That's the momentum in the metric system. That's the unit for momentum in the metric system. Let me be specific about that, okay? 
So, um, you know, by looking at an object's momentum um, and how it changes with time, we have another way of looking at the force that's involved. And so if we take the equation here, this equation in the box here, and we multiply both sides by delta T. So if we say F net times delta T equals delta P, because if I multiply by delta T on the right side, delta T is gonna cancel out. So when I do that, when I multiply the net force by delta T, I create a property called impulse. So in other words, we took that change in momentum equation that for Newton's second law, and we re rearranged it mathematically. And the new property that we get, we call impulse. So change in momentum is what we call impulse. Another way you could look at it is F net times delta T is also impulse. So what this impulse allows us to figure out is as we apply a force to an object for a certain time period, how much does the momentum change, okay? And so we can see, you know, if we look at this equation carefully, that to get produce a momentum change, we could have a large net force for a short time period or a large time period and a smaller net force. Either way, we can produce uh, a change in momentum. Remember, when you're dealing with impulse, impulse does not relate to just momentum. Impulse relates to change in momentum, okay? So keep that in mind. And this slide right here is meant to communicate the idea that when we look at the net force, typically because we're looking at uh, the force involved in, in the force that's making a contact with an object, contact force, um, like for situations for like uh, if you're uh, batting or hitting a tennis ball or a golf ball, if you swing a hundred times, for example, you aren't going to hit the golf ball or the tennis ball or the baseball with the exact am same amount of force every time. But if we look at, you know, over those hundred swings, the, your average net force, okay? So that's what they're saying that the effective force is actually, you know, kind of like the average of your of your of the force over a large number of tries. Okay, we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, the the main idea here is this: they're trying to convey the idea that, um, as I said, you can have to to change an object's momentum. Like if you're hitting a baseball, for example, to change the baseball's momentum. The ball has to make contact with the bat. Well, if the, the ball stays in contact with the bat for a long period of time, they call that good follow through, meaning you can hit the ball further. Whereas, for example, if you're batting and your bat makes contact with the ball over a short time span, that's like a bunt hit because it's not going to go very far, right? So either way, you are changing the momentum, you're producing an impulse, but the, the effect of you know on the actual object depends on how much force and how much of a time uh, difference uh, you know how long you the the object that's creating the force is in contact with the other with the object that is hitting for example okay another important concept when we deal with momentum is this idea of conservation and the reason that this um, this momentum is important is because it is a quantity that we measure that can be conserved, okay? Meaning it remains constant as long as you keep the system isolated, meaning you don't have any, um, your net force is zero. You know, remember, when we isolate a system, we um, keep it safe or protected from all outside forces. And so um, under that situation where you can isolate a system, then the momentum is conserved, meaning the amount of momentum in your closed 
confined system remains constant. Now, you can have different objects, multiple objects in this enclosed system. And those objects can share or exchange momentum. But when you look at the total overall in this isolated system, the total is what remains constant, okay? So um, for this isolated system of objects, the total momentum is always the same. And that's what we mean. We say the total momentum is constant. That is a statement of the conservation of momentum. And you might be thinking, why do we, why do we need to bother with that? Because momentum conservation is very important when we deal with collision type motion. You know, when objects are bouncing off of each other or bumping into each other or hitting each other and sticking together, um, type, different types of collisions um, allow us to utilize momentum conservation to analyze the motion, okay? I mean, if you think about it up to now, we haven't dealt with that type of motion. We've dealt with horizontal motion, vertical motion, projectile motion, circular motion, We've looked at forces, um, but what we haven't studied is um, the motion of objects when they're colliding with one another, okay? And momentum conservation allows us to be able to do that. Now, we aren't gonna go for uh, these subatomic particles like they're showing here, but we will look at some different types of collisions, okay? The first type of collision is an elastic collision. And, and John, I'm sure if you did the momentum um, simulator, then you came across that idea of an elastic collision where the objects are bouncing off of each other, okay? And so there are some characteristics of an elastic collision that you need to understand. Number one, momentum is conserved. Number two, another important property called kinetic energy is conserved, okay? Now we're gonna see here shortly what we mean by kinetic energy, but whatever it is, when you deal with an elastic collision, it is conserved, meaning the sum is always the same. Just like momentum is conserved in an elastic coll collision, so is kinetic energy, all right? The other important thing is that the objects bounce off of each other, okay? They rebound recoil, that kind of thing, okay? So um, that's one type of collision that we can look at. And so they give you a visual here of how we can, you know, um, utilize momentum conservation for an elastic collision in one dimension, which is basically all we can do. We don't do two dimensions, three dimensions, because we don't really analyze in depth that type of motion anyway, all right? So they show you um, these two objects, M1 and M2, and you see that like oval shape around them and closing them, that's telling you that the system is isolated. And in fact, another important idea is that it's frictionless, right? Because if, if friction is involved, you can't conserve energy, okay? So what they're telling you is, what we have to do is we have to look at this system, this isolated system, before the objects collide and after the objects collide. That's what momentum conservation is valuable for because it helps us to look at this isolated system before the objects hit and then now take a snapshot and tell me what's happening after they hit, okay? So in this particular picture on the top, you see M1 is moving with a certain velocity V1 and M2 is moving with a certain velocity V2. And if we take each object and figure out its momentum, so the, the momentum of object number one is P1, plus the momentum of object two is P2, that would give us our total because we only have two objects, right? But we could have multiple objects. We could have more than two. The total of each one, I mean, you, you take the momentum of each one and you add it up to get your total, okay? So before the collision, you have a certain amount of momentum, P total. Now, those two objects hit each other. So let's say, for example, M1 
runs into the back of M2. That's a collision, right? So now let's look at the system after the collision. So after the collision, notice that those two objects are moving in different directions. They were both moving to the right before the collision. Now look at one's moving to the right, M2 is moving to the right, and but M1 is moving to the left, right? But if we take the momentum of each object afterwards, so get the momentum of object number one afterwards. How do you do that? M1 times its velocity. And then take the, the momentum of object number two. So M2 times its velocity. When you add up those totals, P1 and P2 after, you still get the same value. You still get the same total that you had before. So P total is the same before and after your collision, okay? So that's an example of an elastic collision. Those two objects hit each other and bounce off of each other. Momentum is conserved and so is kinetic energy. What about an inelastic collision? Oh, sorry, I should qualify this by saying that you don't ever have to worry about solving any problems that deal with an elastic collision in one dimension because the math is a little bit crazy. And that's because you're do, dealing with not only momentum being conserved, but kinetic energy being conserved. That's a little bit above what we like to do mathematically. So when we want to really do, you know, mathematically analyze collisions, we'll stick to inelastic collision. Okay. And so if you think about the word elastic versus inelastic, you know, you think of elastic as being kind of stretchy and inelastic as not being stretchy. But what this is telling us is the difference in the behavior of the objects after the collision. Okay. So in, in the, the definition for an inelastic collision, momentum is still conserved. So it doesn't matter what type of collision, momentum is conserved. But for an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. So the amount of kinetic energy in your system changes when you compare before the collision to after the collision. But the momentum is conserved. The amount of momentum before and after the collision is the same, but not the kinetic energy. The other thing that we focus on is for a collision type that we call perfectly inelastic. And that is the objects stick together. After the collision, the objects are stuck together. Okay. And so, because the objects that are involved in a perfectly inelastic collision stick together, we have to look at combining their masses after the collision. And because they're stuck together after the collision, they will move with the same common velocity after the collision. And, you know, they give you a, a real world example of, um, you know, why, why we use this information on inelastic and elastic collisions. And, and sports is definitely an area where these types of collisions are relevant because, you know, there, a lot of work has been done to try to reduce the, uh, the concussion level, for example, in football or, you know, um, come up with better uh, equipment to manage sports injuries and that type of thing. So here's an example of an inelastic collision in one dimension. And in particular, they're focusing on a perfectly inelastic collision here because you can see after the collision, the objects are stuck together, okay? So now remember, we take a snapshot of our system before the collision, and then again, after the collision. Before the collision, you have these two objects. Notice they, they both have the same mass, but they definitely have different momentum because they're moving in different directions, first of all, right? Um, so if we look at before, and we take the momentum of, of the mass that's on your left, and call that momentum P1. And then if we add it to the momentum of the object that's on the right, we call that momentum P2. 
when we totaled it up in this particular uh, situation, we got a total momentum of zero. Oh. It means automatically that the total momentum in our system after the collision has to also be zero. But here's the difference. The kinetic energy before is not equal to the kinetic energy after, okay? So momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is not conserved, and notice that the objects are stuck together after the collision, okay? Meaning we no longer have two separate objects, we have now one more massive object, right? Because we take the masses of both of them and add them together. The other important thing, as I mentioned, is if the two objects are stuck together, they have to move with the same common velocity afterwards. You can't be stuck to something and move at a different velocity than it does. All right. Um, I'm not going to go into this reaction type system. What, what this ultimately leads to is the rocket problem. And yes, it, you know, as they say, rocket science, but we're not going to get into that because that deal that requires us to understand systems where the mass is changing and we don't focus on that in this class. Okay. All right. So that's kind of like the background on momentum. But what I want to do now is I want to use some of the tools that I have available for you and look at some information on momentum, uh, especially a couple of sample problems that deal with momentum and momentum conservation. We'll look at impulse. And then we'll come back and we'll get into the business of dealing with energy. Okay. So remember, under announcements, you have some extra resources, the very last item. And I'm going to open up that and I'm going to choose the one that deals with momentum. Okay. And um, this kind of like is a screenshot that I took of some notes I wrote on the board. But, you know, it just kind of is like a summary slide. Okay, so this is dealing with momentum uh, and momentum conservation, right? So, you know, to get momentum, you take mass times velocity. And we only deal with systems where our mass never changes. So the mass of an object before is going to be the same as the mass of the object afterwards. We don't, we don't use, look at systems where we are losing or gaining mass, okay? And so, um, Momentum conservation says that the total momentum in our system is the same before and after a collision. And I define for you the different types of collisions, just the way I just did. And the nice thing that I do here is I give you the mass that's involved in dealing with an inelastic collision, okay? So you look at the momentum of each object before, okay? So the object of, the momentum of object one before, plus the momentum of object two before. But then when you look at the collision afterwards, you have to add their masses together. Why? Because they're stuck together. And then they have the same common velocity afterwards. So if you are going to solve problems dealing with momentum conservation or an inelastic collision, this is the formula that you will use. Notice I did not give you a formula for elastic because we don't solve those types of problems in here. I was wondering how they got to on the videos, how they got to um the second part of that equation, m1 plus m2 equals vf, because they yeah. just went to it and yeah. I, I, they never showed me like the formula. Why they didn't explain to you that the objects were stuck together afterwards? I don't Is remember. What, what uh, I just they was doing a formula. And uh, I forgot which one it was, but. Um, yeah, well, the reason they did that for M1 plus M2 is because if the collision is inelastic, the objects are stuck together after the collision. So that's why they combine the masses. Before right. the collision, you have two separate objects. After the collision, you have one big object because they're now stuck together. Uh, this other screenshot was just me showing the class how you can get from the impulse equation to Newton's second law. Because I said that the impulse equation is another form of Newton's second law. 
So I showed how I did that. Okay. So I just took momentum, which is equal to mass times velocity, and I substituted it in the equation for P. And then since the mass is constant, I can pull it out because it's not going to change. You know, delta means change. Well, since M is not changing, it doesn't need to be, uh, delta does not apply to it. You could think of it that way. So then I pull the M out. And so I'm left with M times delta V. And then I divide both sides by delta T. So M times delta V over delta T, that's another way of writing delta V over delta T is the same thing as acceleration that we learned a long time ago. Change in velocity over change in time is acceleration. So in essence, that equation is equivalent to F equals MA. So, um, and then I showed you also, you know, kind of remind you that the units for momentum kilogram meters per second, okay? All right. It's kind of neat. Yeah, it is kind of neat how that, it actually is, the, 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 even that is a kind of a simplified version because you really have to, if to write the full equation, you have to take into account that the mass can change and that's a calculus thing. So we don't really get into that. That's why, um, you know, we, we kind of stick to the, the basic level there. So um, what I want to use this packet for is to kind of uh, show you some examples of utilizing the momentum formula. Uh, we'll look at the, you know, using the momentum formula, and then we'll look at using conservation of momentum as well. So here, momentum, um, if you want to think of a definition of momentum, the quantity of motion is a good way to think of it. More momentum, more motion. Okay, um, so there's, there's your problem solving pyramid. You know, I like to use that so that you don't have to focus on algebra. You can just look at multiply or divide to figure out whatever you're looking for. Um, just remember your units. Momentum is kilogram meters per second, not kilogram meters per second squared. Kilogram meters per second squared is acceleration, uh, is uh, Newton's. Kilogram meters per second squared is acceleration. I, I keep saying it, sorry, brain cramp. Uh, kilogram meters per second squared is a Newton, but for momentum, you only use kilogram meters per second. So uh, don't, don't mix those units up uh, when you're solving problems, okay? Um, so let's take a look at using a formula says, find the momentum of a bumper car if it has a total mass of 280 kilograms and a velocity of 3.2 meters per second. So they gave you the mass, they gave you the velocity. If they want the momentum, that's simple enough. You just multiply because they're right next to each other, right? So um, M times V, 280 kilograms times 3.2 meters per second. 896 kilogram meters per second, okay? So that's a straightforward formula to use. Most students find the momentum formula, um, you know, easy uh, to, to follow and utilize. So let's take a look at another example. The momentum of a second bumper car is 675 kilogram meters per second. What is its velocity? if its total mass is 300 kilograms. So this time they gave us the momentum of the bumper car and they gave us the total mass. In this case, you know, the, the mass is the car plus the person, right? So um, what they want is the velocity. So you can see clearly from the pyramid that to get the velocity, you have to divide the momentum by the mass. So that's 600, 75 kilogram meters per second divided by 300 kilograms. So that gives you 2.25 meters per second. That's because the kilograms will cancel out. Uh, 
Okay. The law of conservation of momentum. So as I said before, the, this basically tells us that uh, we can isolate a group of objects. And if we do that, the total momentum in the group doesn't change, right? Isolated means what? There's no outside forces. Okay. The, the net external force is zero. If that is the case, then the total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. And so this is a, a, another visual of the idea of an elastic collision versus an inelastic collision. So you can see very clearly in the picture here, if that big truck hits that little car, it's going to transfer some of its momentum to the car and the car is gonna, gonna move, right? Move faster because it's not moving at all, but once it starts moving, it's, it's gonna be moving faster. So you can see in the box for the truck that it has 60,000 kilogram meters per second of momentum. Now, after the collision, the car is going to have some momentum and the truck is going to have some. The truck will lose some momentum, but the car will gain momentum. When you look at the total, it's still going to be 60,000 kilogram meters per second after those two uh, vehicles hit each other, okay? So remember, an elastic collision, momentum is conserved, kinetic energy is conserved and the objects bounce off of each other. Whereas for this perfectly inelastic collision, momentum is going to be conserved, but kinetic energy will not be conserved. So you don't see the diesel car in the picture here, but what's going to happen is that the diesel car is going to come into the picture and connect to the flat car. So that connecting tells us that it's inelastic. But no matter, because afterwards, you will still have the same 40,000 kilogram kilometers per hour of momentum. It will just be shared between the diesel and the flat car. They will be hooked together and moving with the same velocity after, but still, the diesel will give up some momentum, the flat car will gain some momentum, and they will move off together after the collision. So here's a couple of examples that illustrate this idea of the conservation of momentum. So it says a five kilogram cart traveling at 4.2 meters per second strikes a stationary two kilogram cart and they connect find their speed after the collision. Now we know this is a perfectly inelastic collision because they're stuck together afterwards because it says they connect. Well, um, what we have to do then is break down this, um, this motion before the collision and after the collision. So now we can take the momentum of each object before. Caught one, mass five kilograms, velocity 4.2 meters per second. You multiply that, you get 21 kilogram meters per second. What about the second car? It doesn't have any momentum. How come? It says it's stationary. That means it's not moving. If it's not moving, it doesn't have any velocity. It doesn't have any momentum. So the total momentum in our system is 21 kilogram meters per second before the collision happened. That means after the collision, we have to have the same 21 kilogram meters per second. Why? Because momentum is conserved. So after the collision, those two objects are stuck together. So that's why we have to add their mass masses together. Five plus two gives us seven kilograms. Well, the question is, how fast are they going after? They're connected. Let's figure it out. So we know the mass. We know the momentum, we can get the velocity. P divided by M, 21 kilogram meters per second divided by seven kilograms gives me a velocity of three meters per second. So these two car carts are gonna hit each other, connect, 
and move off together with this, this um, same velocity, three meters per second. Now, I will say to you that when you get to problem set number nine, several of the problems are going to deal with systems just like this, where you're dealing with these perfectly inelastic collisions. And you have to remember momentum conservation or you will not be able to solve them. If we did not know the total momentum before and after, we would not be able to solve this problem. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to close that. There's another example that I wanna to go to. That's what I meant to do. So here's another example of momentum conservation. So it says a 50 kilogram clown is shot out of a 250 kilogram cannon at a speed of 20 meters per second. What is the recoil speed of the cannon? So that word recoil is very important because it's implying for us that the cannon is going to move backwards after it is fired, okay? That's why they wanna know the recoil speed. How fast is it going to jerk back or kick back, okay? So now we have to take this uh, motion and look at it. Before the cannon is fired, after the cannon is fired. So before, nothing's moving. The clown is stationary, the cannon is stationary. So my total momentum is zero. So if my total momentum before the cannon is fired is zero, then my total momentum after the cannon is fired has to also be zero, okay? The total has to be the same. But you can see clearly that after the cannon is fired, the clown has gained some momentum. 50 kilograms times 20 meters per second, 1,000 kilogram meters per second, okay? Now we know that the mass of the cannon is still going to be 250 kilograms, but the question is, you know, how fast is it going to kick back? Well, in order to solve that, we need to know the cannon's momentum after. Well, I have a way to find it. If my total has to be zero, and the clown has positive 1,000 kilogram meters per second. The only way I get zero is to add negative 1,000 kilogram meters per second. Positive 1,000 plus negative 1,000 gives me the zero that I must have afterwards. So you see, I use momentum conservation to figure out the momentum of the cannon in this case after it's fired. Now, I'm not done yet because I then have to use that to solve for the velocity of the cannon. So its momentum is negative 1000 kilogram meters per second. You see, you have to be careful here because that negative sign is not telling you greater than less than, it's telling you direction. So if I divide that negative 1000 kilogram meters per second, by 250 kilograms, then I get negative four meters per second. Remember the negative sign on a vector like velocity tells me direction. So this cannon is going to have a speed of four meters per second and it's going to move backwards. That's what the negative sign tells me, okay? But you see, I was able to analyze this motion only because I knew that momentum was conserved, okay? So those are some nice examples. Also under useful links, and you probably have seen this simulator already. Um, I think this is the one you're using for the lab. Let me bring it up real quick. Oh, I, ha I actually, I have it most, um, bookmarked in, in the weekly overviews. Let me just go there and get it. That'll be easier. But you have access to a whole host of simulators, write that through the um, under useful links. So let me just click on it there. Visualizing collisions. Let 
Oh, oh, okay. No, I didn't bookmark it. I have to go back and fix that. I did not realize that it was trying to pull up an old version of that simulator. So I will adjust that. That's my mistake. I didn't catch that before, but let me just show you. I'll go in here in physics. And it is, the correct one is available through the lab um, in the lab class. I just didn't fix it here. So let me see if, no, let me get rid of all this electricity stuff. And let's go find, I think that's the collisions lab right there. And hit the play button, right. So you see, you can turn on all of this stuff. And you can make it elastic or totally inelastic. And you can adjust, you know, the, the mass. Um, well, it'll give you these values when you when you play it. Okay. So you can see here. Okay, so um, it's showing you here the value, the, the mass and the velocity for each one and the momentum for, for each one of them, okay? Um, for objects number one and two. And then you see you can, if you know that, you can get the total momentum, right? Uh, and you can look at you know the total momentum before and afterwards, right? Um, also you could, you could undo this right here and just look at, okay. You know, you could look at how the momentum changes. See, and you can see these two, they're stuck together, right? So now let me, let me reset that, reset that. And I'm gonna make it a totally elastic collision, okay? And I'll turn back all of the bells and whistles. I won't do the center of mass one because that really doesn't help us. I mean, it, it's an important property, but it's not totally relevant for what we want to look at here. Okay, so you see now you can see that the, the, the change in momentum, right? How the momentum of each object changes. Um, mm -hmm. But more than that, you can see because it's elastic that they're bouncing off of each other, okay? So um, this is a good tool to use to help visualize the collisions. And I apologize, I will go back and fix that under your weekly overview so that you do, you do get to utilize that um, simulator to play around with it if you choose to, all right? So uh, how about we do this, I'll stop the sharing, and I'll, we'll take a, just a uh, I think you cut off. I'm sorry. I cut my video off feed <laughs> off and okay. the audio feed, so I apologize. So let's get back together in maybe five, six minutes, let's say 6.30, and then we'll get into our, the looking at energy. And then after that, um, you know, I'll take a look at um, a couple of simulators that utilize energy conservation, and then we'll call it a night. All right.
All right, welcome back. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen again. <coughs> All right, can you see every see the screen now? Yes, ma'am. All right. So in this um the, in this overview, we're going to focus on work and energy. Okay, and uh, we'll we'll look at the definition of work, the definition of energy, and, and then different types of energy, uh, and then we'll look at the conservation of energy. Of course, we'll we'll see um um you know systems where the energy conservation is appropriate, and then. Also, another property we'll look at is power because that's related to work and energy. So um, for this overview, you have some um, items on your plate that problem set number nine deals with momentum uh, and you have a discussion session that deals with energy. And so you have here two chapters in your CK12 textbook, chapters two and eight that you should review and read and then some energy videos. And then I'm gonna cover these energy and work notes here. And then I'll go into um, the announcements and look at the extra resources dealing with energy. And then we'll look at some simulators that actually um, deal with uh, energy conservation. So of course, you know, work and energy are not terms that you have not come across, you know, in your everyday life. You know, these are words that we use in casual conversation all the time. Uh, work could be, you know, I'm going to work tomorrow or, oh, um, you know, whatever you do to make a living, right? Or your job. Um, energy is a concept, you know, like for example, energy drink, right? But you know, of course, like with all of these properties that we're learning about that are based on measurement, we have to be very, um, you know, we, we have to be very specific and focused when we use them in physics. It's not the same as the everyday usage, right? And so, um, you know, that's part of this whole process is to, to focus on the, the rigorous and, and definition that applies in, th in this context and not in everyday conversation. And, and you know, it, this is an important, this is an important, especially this energy stuff because it's pervasive in all of science, right? And this idea of different forms of energy and that energy can be um, exchanged, if you will. That's a really, really important and it's, you know, and it's one of the more important achievements in physics, our understanding of how energy can transform and be utilized to do work and those types of things. Okay. So um, when we talk about work in the physics sense of the word, you know, uh, the physics definition of the word, we're talking about uh, the transfer of energy by a force when it causes an object to be displaced. So we apply a force to an object, that force moves that object, and we look at that and say that work is being done. Okay. So in situations where we a force is applied to an object and that force causes that object to, to move or be displaced, work is done. And we use the, the capital letter W to denote work. Uh, be careful because we've also used the word, the letter W to denote weight, but um, they definitely don't mean the same thing. Work and weight are two very different things. And so just be careful to use them properly in the context that, you know, in, in the situation that you're dealing with, all right? Now, how do we find work? Uh, how do we calculate it? So what we do is we multiply force times displacement. Some books say force times distance. That's fine because we're talking about work where the mo movement is linear. And you learned before um, 
that if you're moving in a straight line, the the size part, the magnitude of the distance and displacement are the same. That's why they can do that. But if you multiply the force times the displacement, then you're calculating the work. Now, the, the caveat is the force and the displacement have to be in the same direction, okay? So when you push or pull on an object, that object has to move in the direction of your push or pull in order to do work. So, you know, an obvious question is, okay, well, what are the different ways you can or can't do work? So obviously if you apply a force to an object and it doesn't move at all, then you aren't doing work. So if you push on the wall in your house and it doesn't move, then you aren't doing work. You can push as hard as you want. But and as long as that wall doesn't move, there's no displacement, then no work is done. Obviously, if you don't apply a force at all, you aren't gonna be able to do any work, okay? But the question then becomes, are there situations where you can apply a force, you can have a displacement. So you, you, you push or pull on the object, the object moves, but you don't do any work. So that's the scenario where um, your force and your dis displacement are not in the same direction. The example of that is when you carry an object. So if you are carrying an object, your force is supporting the weight of the object. Okay, And we know that the weight of the object is pointing down because that's the direction that gravity pulls. So if you're supporting the weight, you have to be in applying, you have to be applying a force that's up. But if you're carrying an object, you're walking forward. So your force is up, but the motion or the displacement is forward, unless you're walking backwards, which could happen too, right? But the idea is that your force and your displacement are not in the same direction. They're perpendicular to each other. So when you carry an object, your force and your displacement are perpendicular, meaning they're at 90 degree angles. They aren't in the same direction. So you have both F and D, but no work is getting done. Okay. So um, since we are dealing with uh, force, we know that unit is Newton's. And Displacement, we know the unit for that is meters. So now we're multiplying those two things together, a Newton times a meter. When you do that, you get a unit called a joule. The unit for work and therefore energy, because work involves a transfer of energy. And sometimes you'll hear energy defined as the ability to do work. They're both in the same units newton meters or joules so be very careful when you are solving problems for me and you are multiplying force times displacement then you must correctly combine the newton and the meter to give me a joule if you don't i will mark it wrong because your unit that shows that you didn't properly manage the units if you don't combine them correctly okay so now let's look cl more closely at the relationship between work and energy. So that's um, what we call the work energy theorem. So if we wanna look at the work being done, the net amount of work being done, look at how a system changes its kinetic energy. So here you see the definition of kinetic energy, one half mass times velocity squared. And if you look at how that kinetic energy changes, so you take your final kinetic energy minus your starting kinetic energy. That difference tells you how much work was done. Okay. Here's another form of energy, gravitational potential energy. So one type of mechanical energy is kinetic energy, 
the energy of motion. Another type of mechanical energy is gravitational potential energy, energy, stored energy by virtue of position. So to get the gravitational potential energy, what you do is you, you vary the object's height. As you lift the object up higher, you store up more gravitational energy. Okay, so to get that, you multiply mass times gravity times height. To get kinetic energy, one half mass times the velocity squared. That's because if the object is moving, it has kinetic energy. Here, we're looking at how the object changes its height and stores up energy. Mass times gravity times height, okay? So this gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy are two forms of what we call mechanical energy. And they can be interchanged in certain uh, situations. Both of them can be interchanged or exchanged in order to do work. And that's what they're showing you here. You know, you store up and release potential energy. So on the left-hand side, you see the situation where they apply a force F to this, um, this chain that's you know, attached to this clock, this weight for this clock. If you apply a force to it and pull the chain down, then what you're doing is you're moving that chain through a displacement D. You're moving the chain down, your force is pulling down, so you're doing work. So that work that's being done in this particular situation is the same as the potential energy that you're storing up because potential energy is mass times gravity times height. Well, in this particular case, mass times gravity is also the force that you are applying. So you're moving that object through a height H as you apply this force F, okay? So as you pull the chain down, you store up energy, potential energy, mass times gravity times height. Once you let that chain go and that weight starts to fall back down, it releases that energy. How much does it release? The same amount that is stored up, okay? So, that's showing you this idea of, you know, storing up energy and then exchanging it to do uh, work, okay? And so um, the example that we just looked at with the, um, the, the, the clock shows an example where only conservative forces are involved. The only force that's involved in that whole process is gravity. Oh, well, I'll put it this way. That, that's not exactly true. In this particular case, because the work that's being done is against gravity, you, you are dealing with a conservative system, okay? So um, any system where you are doing work against gravity, then you are going, it's going to conserve mechanical energy. And, and that's important because when you deal with that type of system, then you don't have to worry about the path that you choose. You only have to focus on the endpoints of the motion, okay? You only have to look at the, where the object started and where it stopped. And that will help you to determine the amount of work being done. And that's because the only force that you're working against is gravity in that situation, okay? Gravity is a conservative force, meaning that when you do work against gravity and store up potential energy, then that energy is going to be conserved, all right? And so, um, you know, as I mentioned before, kinetic energy and potential energy are two forms of mechanical energy. Um, and, and when we 
typically say mechanical, we are thinking about motion, right? Um, storing up energy because of motion. Well, you can clearly see how kinetic energy deals with motion because it deals with velocity, but also potential energy deals with motion because it deals with height and position, okay? And so when you are dealing with conservative forces, um, the total mechanical energy is conserved. So if you add up your kinetic energy and your potential energy, the total is always going to be the same, okay? And since that mechanical energy is constant, that total mechanical energy is constant, you can look at the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at, in the beginning, and then the kinetic energy plus the potential energy at the end, and the totals will always be the same. Okay. Anytime you're dealing with a conservative force like gravity, mechanical energy is conserved and the total amount in your system is always going to be the same. Well, what about systems where you're dealing with non-conservative forces? I mean, um, you know, gravity isn't the only force around, right? And so if you are dealing with a system where there are non-conservative forces like friction involved, then the work done is gonna be the path dependent. So in other words, you can't just look at the starting point and the finishing point. It matters how you go from start to finish when you're dealing with a force like friction because friction, the friction force allows you to, um, you know, change energy of motion into heat, for example. And so it matters how long the path is, for example, or if you're doing a simple experiment of rubbing your hands together, right? Rubbing your hands together. When you do that, you feel heat. Well, it matters how, you know, how, how much, how many times you, you uh, move your hand, the more times you move your hands, the more heat you can generate, right? So it's path dependent when you're dealing with these uh, dissipated forces like friction, for example, okay? What about the work done by these non-conservative forces? Well, see, um, when you are looking at a system and you're including this non-conservative force, you have to, um, I always say, you have to take a back door to figure out how much work it does. You can't measure directly the work done by this non-conservative force because that energy is being lost to the system in many instances. So like, for example, if you rub your hands together, you're moving your hands, so that's mechanical, right? But the heat that you're generating is lost is is lost to the you know environment. Once you stop rubbing your hands, they cool off. That heat is gone. You can't get that back. But you can indirectly measure it. Okay, and the way you indirectly measure it is in that last box. Shows you that if you look at how the kinetic energy changes, plus how the potential energy changes you can determine the work done by your non-conservative forces. That's what WNC, the work done by non-conservative, okay? So you see, if we're going to include this, the work done by these non-conservative forces, then we have to say that we look at our kinetic energy and potential energy at the start, plus the work that's done by this non-conservative force. And that will be equal to the, kinetic energy plus the potential energy of our system at the end, right? So um, again, by rearranging this um, conservation of energy equation, we can, we can indirectly determine the amount of work done by a non-conservative force like friction. And then we have a way of expressing the law of conservation of energy in a broad sense. So if we look at all the energies in our system at the start and at the 
finish, the totals must be the same. And when we say the, you see in that formula, the other energies, OE. So these can be any types of energies. So you could have kinetic energy and, and potential energy at the start. You can have the work done by your non-conservative forces at the start. And then all these other types of energies at the start, whatever they are, electric, chemical, nuclear, thermal, right? And when we add up all the total energies that we started off with, that has to be equal to all the total energy that we end up with. So that's a, that's a broad statement of the law of conservation of energy where you bring in all different types of energies and not just mechanical energy. Uh, efficiency, and I'll just briefly mention that. We're not gonna, we don't really um, get too deep in that. Efficiency allows us to look at how much work out for the energy that we put in. We put in some energy, we get some work out. The efficiency looks at the ratio. Um, a really efficient process is going to have a ratio close to one. But most processes, you know, for real, in the real world are, are not going to equal, you're not going to get an, a ratio equal to one because it's not gonna be 100% efficient, okay? And so they give you just a quick table here looking at some uh, efficiencies of some uh, devices and processes. You can see uh, that you can look at it. Swimming is one of the most, inefficient processes, right? Because you think about it, if you're in, a, in water and you're moving around, all the energy and heat that you're generating gets zapped by the water right away almost, right? Um, and then you could look at the list and see, um, for example, an electric motor is extremely efficient, 98% efficient compared to a gasoline and diesel engine, right? I mean, right now, if you think about it, you know, with the gas prices being so high, you wish you had a, 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 a more efficient device, you know, and that's why these electric cars are so, uh, you know, are going to be uh, so important um, because of the inefficiency of a gasoline and a diesel engine, not to mention the price, right? And then the last uh, property we'll look at here is power. Power looks at the rate at which work is done. So it's work per unit time. Be careful because you can see here that they're using a W for work. And remember to get work, you have to do what? Force times displacement, right? So to get, you take the work that you calculate and divide it by the time. And then the unit for work I mean, for power, excuse me, is the watts. And they're using the symbol W for that as well. So be very careful to distinguish the W for work, which is the property that you're, uh, one of the properties that you're measuring versus the W for the unit watt. And so one watt is equivalent to 100, I mean, one joule per second. So for example, a hundred watt light bulb uses a hundred joules of energy every second. So that's what a watt tells you. Remember, work is measured in joules because work and energy are interchangeable, right? So you can think of power as energy per unit time or work per unit time because work and energy are interchangeable. And then on the bottom there, they give you the conversion factor for the uh, English system measurement of power and that's horsepower, right? So. One horsepower is 746 watts. And they show you here, which I thought was pretty cool, some, um, you know, the power consumption of various uh, body functions, organ functions, if you will. Um, and so they relate that there's a unit called metabolic rate, right? How, how fast are your organs utilizing the energy um, 
that you provide in the form of food, right? Your body takes in food as and transforms it into energy that the body can use. And, the, and we look at metabolic rate in terms of how your body is utilizing that energy or food. And so you can see that um, you, you might think that the brain was the most energy intensive, right? Organ in the body, but it's not. The liver and spleen are because those organs are directly related to um, digesting food. Look at the heart, um, you know, very low metabolism, right? And then this last slide, these are just informational, not anything I would ever task you to know, but it looks at, you know, how um, in energy use in, in terms of consumption, right? And look at that um, in terms of 10 to the 18 joules, right? That's, that's the unit if you look at on the side. So it, by year 2035, well, you could, you know, 2035, the worldwide consumption of energy will be 812 times 10 to the 18 joules. And you can see that as they mentioned here, um, you know, our energy consumption is, is pretty much doubled, right? Since 1990. And then, you know, per capita, breakdown of, of the countries in terms of their power consumption. And um, you can see that, you know, your more industrialized countries, if you will, um, are actually um, per capita, you know, I guess you could say power grabbers, right? And you might be looking at that going like, okay, or China, uh, Russia, these are these are big countries, but when they're talking about GDP and per capita, they're talking about money. And you can think about in a lot of those countries, um, the population is fairly impoverished compared to, um, you know, Japan, United States, UK, you know, what they what they call the more industrialized countries. All right, so that's just um, some background and information on, you know, energy, the different types of energy, mechanical energy and energy conservation. Uh, what I wanted to show you now was to go back in the extra notes folder. And let's see what I have in there, energy. Oh, this this just looks at the units for energy. It shows you how you can take the units for potential energy, you know, kilograms for mass, meters per second square for gravity, meters for height, and then you combine them to get joules. And then I show you how it breaks down to a newton meter. Same thing for kinetic energy. Mass, kilograms for mass, meters per second for velocity, but it's squared. And then I show you how you can get joules here and then how that translates into a newton meter. Why is that important? Because work also is in newton meters, which is equivalent to joules, right? So work and energy have the same units because they're interchangeable, okay? And so in this packet, again, we look at, you know, there are different types of energy. They all have in common that they can cause change, you know? And so for example, electrical energy changes in the mot motion of electric charges, but we focus on mechanical energy here. And what we're looking at is how uh, energy causes a change in the motion of these larger objects when we focus on mechanical energy. Right, changes in the motion, right? And then the other thing they all have in common is that they're measured in joules. 
And so you can see here kinetic energy, energy in the form of motion, one half mv squared measures in joules. The other important thing is that it deals with mass and velocity, but be careful because velocity is being squared. So if you double the velocity, you quadruple, quadruple the kinetic energy. And we can see from this picture that it's fairly obvious, for example, that the big truck is gonna have more kinetic energy because it has the biggest mass and the biggest velocity. And then these motorcycles have the smaller mass, but because this one has the smallest velocity, it's gonna have the smallest kinetic energy. So kinetic energy depends on mass and velocity, okay? Potential energy, stored energy by virtue, virtue of position or height. The way you find it is mass times gravity times height, and it's measured in joules. So you can see clearly here from the picture, this boulder on the top is gonna have more potential energy because it's higher up, okay? And I, you, you think about this in context. If I have two boulders with the same mass, right? And I move them through the same height, but one is on earth and the other is on the moon, the one on the earth is gonna store up more energy because there's more gravity on the earth. And then work, as I mentioned before, work is involves a transfer of energy. Uh, through motion. And the way you find work is to multiply force times distance, force times displacement, because we're dealing with linear displacement, linear motion. We can say force times displacement or force times distance. The main idea is that they have to be in the same direction. And then we show you how to break down a joule, a newton times a meter. All right. So I like this because there's some sample problems. All right, so it says Brett's backpack weighs 30 Newton. How much work is done on the backpack when he lifts it 1.5 meters from the floor to his back? So if he lifts up on the backpack and the backpack moves up that same direction, work is being done. How do you get that work? Well, there's my nice pyramid. I multiply force times distance. 30 Newtons times 1.5 meters, 45 joules. Not 45 Newton meters, 45 joules. A dancer lifts a 40 kilogram ballerina, 1.4 meters in the air and walks forward 2.2 meters. How much work is done on the ballerina during and after the lift? Well, to lift up the ballerina, you have to support the ballerina's weight, but be careful here. The common mistake is to say the ballerina's weight is 40 kilograms. That is incorrect. Kilograms is mass. To get the ballerina's weight, we have to take the ballerina's mass times gravity. So the force that you have to balance in order to lift the ballerina is her weight which is 392 Newtons. So now we take that force and we multiply it times the distance that the ballerina is going to travel during the lift, which is 1.4 meters. So you multiply those two and you get 549 joules of work being done in order to lift the ballerina. Now, once you've lifted the ballerina, you can walk 2.2 meters, you can walk 10 meters, you can walk 100 meters. If you are carrying the ballerina, in other words, you will have the ballerina extended up over your head, right? Then you're not going to be doing any work after the lift because the force that you are applying is up to support the ballerina's weight but you're walking forward. So this is an example where your force and your distance are perpendicular and not in the same direction. So no work is done after the lift. You do no work to carry the ballerina around. The only work being done is when you lift the ballerina. Okay. So now, uh, conservation of energy 
this just highlights the idea, you know, restatement of the conservation of energy. Uh, you, you might have heard it said, um, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. So what forms? Mechanical. You see, you could change potential to kinetic. You could change mechanical energy to thermal energy. You could change chemical energy to thermal energy. These are all just examples, right? So some systems where energy is conserved, mechanical energy is conserved. For example, a pendulum. When, a, when you swing a pendulum back and forth, um, mechanical energy is conserved. And in fact, um, John, I believe you've done the lab already for this, where you have the skater, I mean, the, the, um, the, yeah. skateboarder, the skateboarder, right? The skateboarder? Uh, right? Yes, ma'am. And, and when you do the one where there's no friction, that energy just keeps going back and forth between, you know, the, the, the mechanical, I mean, potential and kinetic, but the skater, the total energy in that system never changes. Um, another example of a system where mechanical energy is exchanged but, and conserved is like a, a gravity driven roller coaster. You know, if you pretend the roller coaster, there's no friction involved, then um, the total energy in that system is always going to be conserved. And I'll show you a, I'll show you uh, some simulators that utilize that here shortly. But what about a system where um, you do include friction? So you see on the left, like the marble in the bowl, that's almost um, just like the skateboarder with no friction, the marble is going to just go back and forth and it's going to maintain the height. It is always going to come back to the height that it started with if you don't have friction, just like the skateboarder uh, in the lab class. But if you add friction in the system, so this is like the second part two where you do include friction and you see that the skateboarder eventually comes to, the, to a stop. They don't, you know, they lose energy. And so if you remember, you're trying to time it for a minute, but when you put friction in, it'll only go for a couple of seconds and then you can't really get anything else in terms of reading measurements, right? That's because when you include friction, like on the right-hand side, you lose energy, you, turn, you convert mechanical energy into thermal energy. And so that thermal energy is lost. And so the marble is not going to maintain the mechanical energy is going to lose all of it um, in the form of thermal energy or heat, you could think of. And that's what's happening here with this uh, skier. The skier is going to come down the slope and you have this unpacked snow. That unpacked snow is like powdery. So it'll, it, it'll give friction. And that's what will slow the, the skier down. But now if somebody comes along and plays a trick, and they take that snow and they pack it so that it's real, you know, compacted and slick like ice. When the skier comes down the slope, there's not going to be anything to offer the friction and slow the skier down. So they're just going to keep going. And then, as I mentioned, power is the rate at which work is done, work per unit time, the unit for a power in the metric system is the watt. And one watt is one joule for every one second, okay? And so um, I do have under useful links, some nice simulators bookmark that deal with this. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go to FET because you're gonna use the FET simulator in lab class. I'm gonna go to this one, the one that just plain sim says simulator. And I'll show you a couple of systems. So for example, a pendulum. If we take this pendulum system and we look at the energy, and I'll start it. Oh, I'll let it go. Okay. So you can see what's happening there. As that pendulum swings, you convert mechanical energy from potential to kinetic. So sometimes it's all potential, and that's when the pendulum is at its highest point, and sometimes it's all kinetic. That's when the pendulum is at its lowest point. And then sometimes it might be 50-50 or 
you know, 40, 60, depending on where it's at in the swing. But notice that total is staying the same. And that is because this pendulum is being controlled by gravity. And remember, gravity is a conservative force. So you are going to conserve mechanical energy. Okay. Another system is like a spring pendulum. So if we look at the energy involved here, same thing. You see, that total energy is always the same. If you take the potential energy at any point and add it to the kinetic energy, you'll get the same total all the time. And that is because this spring pendulum is operating under the control of gravity. Remember, when you're dealing with gravity, the mechanical energy is going to be conserved. And also another important thing when you're dealing with gravity, the work being done by this system does not depend on the path. It only depends on where it starts and where it stops in terms of what you're, when you're measuring. The other system that we looked at that deals with mechanical energy being conserved is a projectile. So when you did projectiles for problem set number five, you did not have to worry about force and energy, but we could take a look at this. So you see, if we look at this energy in this system, notice that the kinetic energy and the potential energy are changing but the total is staying constant. And that is because if you remember back to projectile motion, the acceleration in this system is being caused by gravity. The force in this system is being provided by gravity. And anytime you're dealing with gravity, which is a conservative force, you conserve mechanical energy. Right? Um, also, they got a nice little simulator here on, on di different collisions types. Just to go back and look at momentum, you could, I won't do it in slow motion. But you see, I have it on an elastic collision. And you see, we could look at this kinetic energy just to see. We know that um, we could look at this from momentum. The momentum in the system is conserved. See, because you got before and after being the same, but we could also look at kinetic energy in this system. Let's reset it and start it. You see, the total kinetic energy is the same, right? But now let's reset it and do an inelastic collision. We can look at the momentum, okay? And we see that the total momentum is, is conserved. And now let's look at the kinetic energy. You see, we start with a certain amount but we don't keep that. The gap in between represents the kinetic energy that's being lost during this inelastic collision. Okay. So, you know, you have some great tools that I made available to you to help you with all of these topics. If you have not taken advantage of some of these tools under useful links, um, you might want to do that, especially this physics classroom tutorial site, um, because all of the topics that we're covering are represented there, but this there's a really nice one on work, energy, and power. And, and, and especially this whole one here with the analysis of situations where mechanical energy is conserved. So they, they show you, for example, for a pendulum or a pendulum motion, how the energy is conserved. Um, for a roller coaster, how the energy is conserved. Okay. And then there's some nice, oh, the ski jumper where it, the mechanical energy is conserved. Ooh. And then some practice problems. Okay. So that's a very good site to go to, the physics classroom site under useful links. See, physics classroom.
that's a very good site to go to to um to practice for all of the topics but especially work energy and power got some nice problems worked out and you can try them and then check yourself to see did you solve it correctly because they provide you not just with the answers but they show you how to work it out okay all right so with that i'm going to stop the share that is uh, pretty much what i wanted to share with you i'm uh, definitely open to any questions that you might be having right now so um, feel free to ask away Okay, the, the notes that you went through, can we get to that on our canvas? Weekly overviews. Oh, okay, okay. Weekly I, I overviews, it. right? And then remember in announcements, you have access to all the extra resources. It's the very last item. Oh, okay, okay. All right, what I said, then I appreciate it. Uh -huh, no problem. Yeah, and I'm gonna go in and um, update the link on that. Um, momentum simulator that visualizing collisions that's i didn't realize the link wasn't um it was going to an old version so i'm going to fix that for you all right so if you don't have any questions for me uh, i will be posting this recording in a couple of days uh, bear with me because uh i'll be traveling tomorrow so it probably won't be until thursday before i post the video but um you can check the announcements and, and uh, as soon as it's available, I'll put it out there. All right, so, um, you know, if you're working this weekend and you have questions, don't feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will be doing my best to maintain my office hours, but like I said, I'm going to a conference in Texas starting tomorrow. And so, um, I don't know totally what my internet access and capability will be, but I'll do my best to stay in touch. All right. All right, so I'm gonna stop the recording now.